Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. I am here today on a very hot day. Very hot day. Don't know where you are, but it's very hot where I am. I don't know if you can see, but Guinness is passed out on the floor over here. Jamie's asleep in one of the chairs in the window and it is hot. So wherever you are, I hope you are staying cool. I'm here today to do something I haven't done in a long time, which is a, very, a specific review of just one book. I'm here most specifically to talk about Girl, Woman, Other by Bernardine Evaristo. This is the co-winner of the Booker Prize from last year, 2019. If you're unaware, it for the very first time there was a tie in the Booker Prize. They awarded this book and The Testaments by Margaret Atwood. And consensus had seemed to agree on the fact that Evaristo should have been the winner. It, the whole th to me the whole thing I will link my reaction video down below it feels like the whole thing was kind of gross and like they decided they were going to award the testaments no matter what or at least certain sections of the jury decided they were going to award the testaments no matter what and that was always going to happen but it's nice that they fit this in Bernardina Baristo is the first woman of color to win the Booker Prize and she did it for this book which is the stories of 12 black women or women of color I will not be doing spoilers in the first half of this review. I will be doing spoilers in the end. I will tell you when we get to the point where I'm going to transition from one to the other so you can avoid the spoilers if you don't want. But basically, this forms a tapestry of the experience and lives of black women in the UK in the current moment. And I'm just going to say it. It is really deeply fascinating. I could see where somebody might think it's a little bit slow, but personally, I just really enjoyed it. One thing that was a little bit of an adjustment in the beginning is that there aren't really periods. I'm not saying really, there aren't any periods. There's no way you're gonna be able to read this, but always on the first page of the first three chapters or so, I had like a, about a, for a two to three page adjustment to get into the story because it just, it felt very different. But by the end, or even by the halfway point, I was really, really enjoying that and the way it is written. So what is very interesting about this book is that it addresses the issue of race and racism in the UK and in the modern world, but it also addresses the uh, topics of colorism, feminism. It is deeply interested in all of those things. It's really interested in art and place and caste and hierarchy, and it addresses all of those without ever feeling heavy-handed, which is, I think, extremely impressive. It never feels forced, it never feels contrived, it feels like it's just telling stories. It does feel a little bit like a book of short stories, in a sense, which I know some people might consider it to be a mark against this. I heard that complaint lobbed against Homegoing by Yagyasi. The structure of that book was that each chapter jumps ahead a generation, so you, there isn't really a character that forms a through line. That's not really the case here. The, the inciting incident is that the person who the very first chapter is about, Emma, is a playwright, and she is has existed on the periphery of the London theater scene kind of raging against the London theater scene for what it is and for its exclusion of diversity and things like that. And she has reached a point where she is now being accepted in. She is doing a play that is going to be, I think it's at the National Theater. I'm not British, so <laughs> these terms don't didn't, don't mean as much to me as they would to a British person. But uh, she's doing a, a, play, a play at the National and there's a lot of pressure on it and on her for this, and that is kind of the inciting incident of the story. I don't know if you can see this with the sunlight, but it's divided into chapters, and each chapter is, div is divided into three, and the groups of people kind of relate to each other. So you go from Amma to Yaz, who is her daughter, Dominique, who was her former theater partner, and then in chapter two, you go to a sort of different group. But the thing that links them all together, even if only loosely, is this theater production that is going to be debuted. Uh, the night of the in inciting incident of uh, Girl, Woman, Other. And they are all kind of linked by that. And th in some cases, it is surprising how they are linked. And I thought that was a fun thing to do as well. And I, I, no spoilers in this part, so I won't, I won't talk about how. But I, that is another thing that was kind of a joy to discover. Some of the characters that seem on the periphery are actually very closely linked to um, Emma and her story. So it may seem like they're disparate, but it really what happens is 
you get a wild sense of the world and it is what what is so good about this book in a lot of ways is that it is not afraid to be complicated and it is not afraid to come at the same topic from a lot of different angles to show the breadth of the issue and to show the issue from a lot of different sides and a lot of different points of view there is there are characters who voted leave there are characters who voted remain if you're familiar with brexit and there are different perspectives that, on a whole bunch of different topics um, one thing that is interesting in as well is that so in one of the sections uh, it is telling the story of a woman and her wife who, who a woman and her wife a woman and her husband who were both immigrants to the UK were living in London and he had been a fisherman or thought he could be a fisherman so he wanted to go to smaller towns on the periphery of England or even out down to islands to get jobs there so they went into these smaller towns and had a really hard hard time adjusting and finding place and finding jobs homes because of systemic racism that wanted to keep them out and then later in the book so they end up returning to london in order to live their lives so you see that perspective and at another point you find a character who kind of marries into a white family in a rural area and she has children who want to get out so they go to london and the racism that they experience in london is so extreme that they end up going back to small towns so you see the same kind of issue from different perspectives you see the point of view where a city can be a safe place where you get away from racism and you don't venture out into the smaller less populated areas because that's where the racism is and then you also see that no london london and other big cities can be very dangerous as well and it's just really interesting and the idea of fitting in or passing in a way uh comes into play a lot as well it, that kind of gets tied to the issue of colorism and how certain families have a tendency to get lighter as they um progress in generations and it's just very very fascinating and every story is interesting i really enjoyed them i i even enjoyed some at some times debating with them the book is deliberately prodding you to get outside of your own experience and to think about how different the experiences of all these characters are. I don't think I mentioned at the beginning, but I did this as a buddy read with Lindsay from Lindsay's Book Life. I will link her channel down below. It was a great experience, and part of why it was a great experience was that I really think this book lends itself to like a buddy read situation or a book club situation or a uh, book group situation, whatever you want to call it. I always say we take our own baggage into books with us, and I think what's interesting about this book is that Bernardine Evaristo is deliberately inviting you to do that. A lot of what happens in this book, a lot of the characters' motivations and what they do and their place in the world is open to interpretation. This is not a book where Evaristo is going to provide you with neat and neat answers or situations that have an easy summary or you can just read and say, yes, this is the point of that. It's not a tidy book at all. She invites you to bring your preconceived notions, perhaps prejudices, into the book so you can grapple with the things that you find. I think that is utterly brilliant. And there were many situations in this book where Lindsay and I approached a character from a very different perspective or got a very different read on a situation or a specific line in the book jumped out to us as maybe potentially problematic or offensive, any number of interpretations like that. And I think that's really interesting because I really think it's all deliberate. Bernardine Evaristo is inviting you to have these conversations. And really a buddy reader or a book club or something like that is the best way to do that because otherwise you're having the conversation with yourself. So if it is an option, I definitely recommend going that route for this book. And honestly, I think it works really well. I, I really enjoyed that experience of reading and discussing and trying to figure out where how things fit together and what they mean in the larger picture of things. I'll talk a little more specifically about at least one of those examples in the spoiler section. We're not there yet. Uh, but I will say there is one character, and I won't go too in-depth about which one or why, but there's at least one character that I think... I think Evaristo is including to get at a larger conversation. The problem is that larger conversation is so large that I'm not sure the book manages to come up with anything really coherent about it. And in fact, it's almost difficult to see 
how it fits in to that larger conversation. That's the kind of one instance. And I, I, I might as well, I guess, talk about it. So one of the characters is transgender or non-binary. Non-binary, specifically in this case. And there are a lot of issues that that character deals with and that other characters on their periphery and in, the, in their circle uh, deal with about them and the, their lives and in terms of acceptance. And it's handled in a way that doesn't really engage in the politics of it, but because some of the characters have negative reactions toward this non-binary you know, character, it does have the feeling of being problematic, almost a little bit J.K. Rowling, and I won't get into where I ended up on that issue, but I will say that that was like the one area that seemed a little bit off to me. And when it first came up, I was kind of forgiving of it, but as it came up or was glanced at more in subsequent chapters, it seemed a little a little bit more and more and more, and then something happened at the end, and I, I'll talk about that in the spoiler section. But other than that incident and that one character, I think the book does a really good job portraying a lot of different points of view, attitudes, political sp places on the political spectrum, the sexual spectrum. There are characters who are lesbian, bisexual, or who are, are almost fluid in their sexuality. They have relationships with the men and women. And it, it, it that's all very interesting. And none of it feels gimmicky. None of it feels very manipulative or cloying. It never feels like Bernardine Evaristo is doing something specifically to shock you, which is very refreshing. She never feels like she's doing anything deliberately to provoke an emotion out of you, which feels amazing and wonderful. And I just really enjoyed that and, and that sensibility and the way the story flows and ebbs and builds onto it. Even in surprising ways, subsequent chapters can add something to a previous thing and even in accidental ways. I think one of the most interesting things is that in the first two chapters, as I mentioned, you meet Amma first, she's the playwright, and then you meet Yaz, her daughter. And what's interesting right there is that you're introduced to this idea that people will reveal things to you in the course of their own narration that you can see that they necessarily might not. You are able to see their blind spots and recognize them for what they are, even if they cannot. And what's interesting is that then she uses some of the other characters to play off of that idea. For instance, Emma, in her chapter, you see some of the areas in which she's being a little hypocritical, in which she is quote unquote compromising or selling out her young ideal ideals and the way in which she lived her life as a young person rebelling against the system. And you can see how her daughter Yaz pokes at some of those things. And then in Yaz's chapter, because this is her mother we're talking about, you see a little bit more explicitly ways in which her mother contradicts her own messaging and her own beliefs. But at the same time, and this is so interesting, through Amma's description of Yaz, and then through meeting as and having her take the, the force of the narrative, you start to realize, hey, she's hypocritical too, actually. And you see all the way, and she is, because she's young, she's very oblivious to it, and she has not had to make compromises in her life. And that's so interesting. And Bernardine Evaristo never spells this out, but you can read this book and you can certainly see that. And I'm sure you can read this and see it in different, uh, different um, with different interpretations, that that happens to be mine, and maybe that's something I'm thinking about a lot since I'm raised. I'm literally raising a teenager, and I'm at a point in my life where I am kind of thinking about. Uh, I'm far enough away from my teens and my early twenties that I kind of think about things like that. You when you have expectations for life, and then you start making compromises over time. But that's the thing. Yaz has never had to make tough decisions, and she's never had to provide for a family, and you can sort of see the ways in which she's oblivious to the way the world actually works or the ways in which she's completely hypocritical anyway. She has this idea that she is independent. She's the one who calls out. She and her friends have this delightful term for each other that I will not, <laughs> I won't mention here on the channel because it's a curse word and I'm trying not to anger the YouTube gods since I got flanked, flagged for language on a different video. And yet she has these these ideals that she says she holds to and she's she's the one who uh, will poke through them and force her way into the honest interpretation of things. But she also really expects her mother to take care of her. Like she fully expects that her mother is going to sell her home so she can pay for a smaller apartment for herself and then get, yeah, as an apartment in the city. And it's like, oh, honey, that is not how the world should work. 
get yourself a job. And it's kind of, you run into situations like that a lot throughout the book. And it's just very interesting how people will accidentally reveal themselves to you. And Bernardine Evaristo gives them the room to do that. And it, it doesn't feel forced, it doesn't feel contradictory in a way that would be bad. It's just fascinating. So I really enjoyed this book, in case you can't tell. It is definitely going to be one of my favorite reads of the year. I don't think it supplants Song of Solomon as favorite, but it's up there. I think I'm going to leave the non-spoiler review there and head briefly into the spoiler section. So if you don't want to know some of the specific details, I don't think there's really any way you could spoil a lot about this book, but if you want to avoid specific conversation, you can just end the video right here and that'll be fine. I'll give you a couple of seconds just in case you, you need, a, need a minute and admire the lovely cover of the book, as we do. Incidentally, there is also, uh, if you're, I mean, not to drag anybody back in, but there's a quote from, Bernard, from Elif Shafak about this book on the back of my version of this that says, Bernardine Evaristo is one of those writers who should be read by everyone everywhere. Her tales marry down-to-earth characters with engrossing storylines about identity and the UK of today. And I think that really is a perfect summary of this book. So, if you're still here, I'm going to assume that you want the spoiler discussion. So let's get into it. Now, I mentioned that the non-binary character is a bit of a sticking point. It feels like some of the conversation points against that character feel J.K. Rowling-ish. And it's so, because Bernardine Navaristo is being so low-key in this book, she's not really manipulating any of the, it doesn't feel like she has much of an authorial presence, even though she does, she absolutely does, creating this world. It feels like, is that her opinion? Is that what she's trying to argue? What's going on? And because it sounds like a very J.K. Rowling approach to transgender or non-binary characters. And you start to think, like, what, what, is that what she's saying? Is that what, is she trying to argue that they shouldn't have a place in feminism? And it happened, like, two or three times so that I was starting to get really bothered by it. And then here, I know, I think Lindsay, I think, was a little more bothered by it, but I think here's, here's where I come out on that. And then we'll get to my other kind of spoiler discussion in a second. Well, okay, I'm going to circle back to that because I kind of got ahead of myself. The way the book is structured is that there are all of these different stories of the women, and then one of the chapters is the after party. So after the play is done, there's, a, there's an after party, and a lot of the characters throughout the book are in the, find themselves in the same room, and they interact with each other. And I was really excited about this chapter when I saw that it was there because I really wanted these characters to interact with each other. I wanted closure on certain things that had happened. I want, you know, you want, you expect a lot as a reader. And I was thinking, this is perfect. It's, it, they're all gonna be in the same room. And plus you really it come to like and enjoy a lot of the characters in this book. So it's nice to get another chance to see them and uh, experience them. And I ended up thinking that that chapter largely is unnecessary. And, I think part of the reason for that is that you don't actually, and it's difficult to really complain because a lot of the complaints about it are kind of you trying to force a specific narrative decision onto Bernardine Evaristo and her not adhering to that. And she doesn't have to do the things that you expect her to do or that a conventional narrative would do. In fact, I respect her for not doing things that conventional narratives would do, but it is a little disappointing because you can't even really say that every character gets a moment. Morgan, the uh, non-binary character, is really only referred to, doesn't get a moment in it at all. Morgan does come back a little bit in the epilogue, and the epilogue is something I'm going to get to in a second. But it feels like it doesn't add anything to the stories that you already got. The only thing it does, in fact, it makes one of the characters, a male character, a little bit more of a presence as if he had been more of a presence in the rest of the book and he really wasn't and you didn't need him to kind of have a moment in the spotlight just a brief moment hey so i'm editing this video right now and i'm realizing that there is actually a moment in the after party that really adds to one of the previous stories and i wanted to jump in and talk about that really quickly so one of the characters is a teacher of a high school and the other uh, the other character is her student and the student suffered a horrible depression because she was raped while she was a student. Once she started to piece her life together, she relied on the teacher 
to get her life together to study very hard and the teacher pushed her very hard and there's an interesting push and pull here and I think you bring you, you bring your own baggage into this relationship and the dynamic between these two people and for me I kind of landed on the side of the teacher because I think as teenagers especially if you've been through things you tend to resent the people who help you and I felt like that was something that was at play and the teacher ended up deeply hurt that after she helped this student she just went off into the world and never said thank you never checked in on her said hello let her know how she was doing or anything like that so now all these years later they run into each other at the after party and they have this moment and I'm going to read it to you because this is the spoiler section so why not uh, it dawns on Carol that she's always thought of Mrs. King through, the, through a haze of teenage rage, yet the woman was probably only trying her best. She just didn't go about it in the right way. So she says, thank you for what she did, and Shirley says, don't be silly, you have nothing to thank me for. And then Carol sees that the watery eyes have become actual tears. It dawns on her that Mrs. King really did help her when nobody else could or would. How could she have not realized this until now? And to me, this is a really, really profound emotional moment, and it happens right here in the after party, and it's the only storyline that crescendos to something. And I think it's unfair to expect all of the storylines to build to something like this and have this big emotional revelation, but it is really nice that this one did, and because I'm a foster father. I hope many years down the line I have a moment like that with my foster son. So it, it really deeply resonated with me. But it just feels like all of the other storylines are kind of left dangling. So if she could have, if Bernard, she being Bernardine Evaristo could have found a way to have that moment in the book without the after party, it would have been good. And then if she could have found a way to insert the other moment that I'm going to talk about later into the rest of the book, I feel like you ultimately don't need this chapter. However, there are things that I, uh, elements of the after party that I did really like and would have liked to see incorporated into the rest of the book. You just didn't necessarily need them in this one chapter that feels like it should be a summary, but it's not. So you start to wonder, as much as I wanted that chapter, was it actually necessary? Does it actually really do anything? And the only thing it does is it has this wonderful last paragraph that I think forms, it's the only moment Bernardine Evaristo allows herself a thesis statement. And that is the thing that really made me okay with um, the way the transgender slash non-binary character was handled. At the end, Emma is left with her friend Dominique and they're talking and then Dominique talks about how she has struggled with being accused of being transphobic because they want inclusion and she's trying to say that she's running, um, I think, I believe it's like a women's writing festival kind of thing. Um, and she wants to do just biological women and she was called out for that and she's kind of bitter and angry about it. And then Dominique says, I'm not a babe to them M's. I'm an old school has been who's part of the problem. They don't respect me. And here's the final paragraph which is Amma's re response to that. Then you need to talk to them, Dom, and we should celebrate th that many more women are reconfiguring feminism and that grassroots activism is spreading like wildfire and millions of women are waking up to the possibility of taking ownership of our world as fully entitled human beings. How can we argue with that? And that is the end of the book. And I think that's, like I said, that's the moment that Bernardine Evaristo allows herself to enter the conversation and create a thesis for the book and it's beautiful and it's wonderful and it really clarified to me that issue of the transgender representation in this book and how people are trying to shut it down but Bernadine Evaristo is saying no we're not erasing anything we're not redefining anything we're, we're expanding and that's a good thing and I really enjoyed that the problem then is that there's an epilogue after that and just like my, my critique of the J.R. Ackerley book I just finished, which was My Father and Myself, it feels like there's an ending, and then the, you re keep reading into an epilogue. And even though there's an end, the epilogue is supposed to be separate, treated differently, it feels like, as a reader, you just drift along into the epilogue, and it starts to feel like that is the actual ending. And the epilogue has to do with a character named Penelope. Now, Penelope, interestingly, when she gets her chapter in the book, seems to be the only white female character in the book. And Lindsay and I had been having a conversation about this because I, I said to her, it's like, I'm really confused by this. I thought it was 12 stories of black women living in the UK. 
and we have a white woman here. So that's interesting. But Penelope finds out that she was adopted when she's an adult. And I was thinking to myself, it's like, and as I, I said this to Lindsay, it's like, I bet there's going to be a revolu revelation about her identity. And maybe she's just light skinned black or only part bl half black, something like that. And sure enough, in the epilogue, Penelope, who's now reti a retired teacher, takes one of those DNA tests and finds out that she is, I think, a quarter black. And she was a character who was pretty overtly racist. And it was interesting because until we got to that revelation, I kind of back walked on that, I backtracked on that to Lindsay and was saying, maybe I'm wrong, maybe it's, but it is interesting because I think the point of this is to be, is that Bernardine Evaristo is saying, here's this character who is so sure of her place in the world but she doesn't actually know anything about herself. And yes, this is a specific situation because that character is adopted, but how sure can any of us be of our situation in the world? You know, one thing, I'm telling on my mother a little bit here, but my mother is into genealogy and she kind of stopped doing genealogy on her own family because her family is in Italy and they're in the portion of Italy that is not that far from what is now Croatia. And a lot of people would go back and forth between there. And a lot of people in what is now Croatia were going back and forth to Africa. So she was afraid that she was going to find out that she had African lineage, which is just ludicrous. And I think Bernardine Evaristo was kind of using this character to say, we, we think we know who we are. We think we have these very specific ideals, like I'm European, this is what I am. But you go back far enough, you probably have a black relative, a black ancestor, something like that. And I thought that was really fun. And then I didn't make the connection, but Lindsay made the connection. Uh, and again, this is the spoiler section. I hope you are tuned into that. A latter character named Hattie, who has a farm, has a, um, has a, has a, she is, I think, half black. And she has a daughter with a white man. And her father forces her to give up that daughter for adoption. And I didn't make the connection right away, which seems silly. But Lindsay was like, well, Penelope has to be that baby. And sure enough, she is. But it, and Lindsay felt the same way about this. It feels like maybe if Bernardine Evaristo had made a connection, a little, that connection a little bit more obvious to say somebody like me who overlooked it, she wouldn't need the epilogue. You can make the connection and say, oh, this white woman who is kind of racist and is so sure of her place in the world is actually a quarter black and she has no idea. And that epilogue is the only moment of the book that ends up feeling cheesy because not only does she find this out and she, at first she's very conflicted, she doesn't know what to do, she doesn't want people to find out because she's kind of ashamed that she is a quarter black. But then she finds out that she is a match for someone in that DNA system. This is very 23andMe, but it's a different service. She finds out her mother is still alive and she contacts her and she goes and meets Hattie. And this is when Morgan comes in because Morgan is Hattie's uh, grand child and facilitates the meeting and that's the only part of the after party and epilogue where Morgan really becomes a character which seems kind of silly but whatever anyway and then Penelope meets her mother describes her to herself in some kind of unflattering kind of gross ways but has this primal reaction to her that kind of cures her of racism not necessarily. I'm, I'm kind of simplifying. And since this is the spoiler part of the review, let's just go into there. This is the way the book actually, actually ends in the epilogue. This metal-haired wild creature from the bush with the piercingly feral eyes is her mother. This is she. This is her. Who cares about her color? Why on earth did Penelope ever think it mattered? In this moment, she's feeling something so pure and primal it's overwhelming. They are mother and daughter and their whole sense of themselves is recalibrating. Her mother is now close enough to touch. Penelope had worried that she would feel nothing, or that her mother would show no love for her, no feelings, no affection. How wrong she was. Both of them are welling up, and it's like the years are swiftly regressing until the lifetimes between them no longer exist. This is not about feeling something or about speaking words. This is about being together. So, it's almost green bookian, if I may completely invent a word, where it's like just the fact, finding out that you are related to a black person cures racism. And... It seems a little bit simplistic for such a complicated book. And I thought that was a really depressing note, not depressing, but disappointing note to end the book on. And a little, it, it's, uh, yeah, I, I'm losing words because it seems like for a book that really invited you to make a lot of the connections, 
it starts making a connection for you at the end, but it implies that if only we could get this sense of togetherness, racism would be gone. And I don't think it's that simple. And I don't think Bernardine Evaristo actually thinks it's that simple, but it seems to be what this moment is saying. And Lindsay agreed with me about that. If you disagree, let me know. I would love to hear it. So that is my, those are the parts of the book that I kind of had an issue with. And there's no way to talk about them without this spoiler section. And I would love to hear what you think about those if you have read it, if you, or if you've at least watched the, spo the spoiler section and have not read the book yet. Let me know what you think of that. Drop it in the comments down below. But by and large, I really did enjoy this book, and I'm very glad that I finally got around to reading it. It took me a full year to get here. I, this book jumped out at me when it was on the long list for the Booker Prize, and continued to be, pique my interest when it was on the short list, and then it went on to co-win, and I'm very glad that I finally got around to reading it, especially since I believe in a week they're going to be announcing the long list for this year's Booker Prize. And I'm really looking forward to, to that. I will do a reaction and looking forward to watching the, the prize progress this year. Anyway, I hope a lot of this makes sense because hopefully I can edit this together and it will flow rather smoothly. But I've actually gotten interrupted by several different phone calls from work. People have walked in and out of the room where I'm filming this. And um, hopefully, the other thing about that is that it's kind of hard to maintain a, a line of thought. So hopefully all of this makes sense. And hopefully the review doesn't seem very choppy and weird. We'll see. That's just your glimpse behind the curtain of the creative process of me. <laughs> chaos, basically. It's chaos. Anyway, if you've read Girl, Woman, Other, I would love to hear what you think of it. Uh, again, I would love to have your thoughts on the ending if you have watched that far. And uh, drop them in the comment section down below. If you have other recommendations based on this, I would love to hear that. I have another book by Bernardine Evaristo on my shelf. And I'm, looking, um, I'm thinking about another one as well because I really think she's a fantastic writer. And anyway, if you've made it this far in the video, thank you. You are the best. I really appreciate your time watching this. I will be back. As always, happy reading.